This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. And that just keeps happening generation after generation. But it was a good indication as to how quick the microbiome can change. We're talking within, you know, 48 hours. We've never had levels like we have now. And he said, that's curious. Do you think that people are starting to wake up to the fact that antibiotics are bad? I do. I see evidence of that all the time. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the health journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? In season one of The Shift, we explore the fascinating field of gut health and help you discover what is really going on with your digestion, microbiome and health. The gut is amazing. Changes our concept of the human body. Become useless to the healthcare system. We're always shifting. Your genes are shifting, your microbes are shifting, everything is shifting. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. In part one of this episode, we talked about the makeup of the microbes that live inside of us and why they're so crucial to health. In part two, we're going to explore antibiotic use and how we can help to develop a healthy microbiome. The most well-known thing to damage our microbiome is, of course, antibiotics. Antibiotics were mandated by the World Health Organization quite some time ago, but are still widely prescribed. With antibiotics, there are two issues. The first is that they impact our microbiome health. The second is that we're seeing more and more cases of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. These bacteria have adapted so that many regular antibiotics are now ineffective. Here we have Summer Bock explaining the effect of antibiotics on the gut. So you've killed off an important part of that ecosystem, and it takes quite some time for that to come back. There are studies that show that even taking probiotics can actually interfere with the regrowth of the natural microbiome, that we can be inhibiting the natural succession of bacterial regrowth. So I think that we have to be a little bit careful. We have a huge assumption right now on the table that says you take probiotics and it's going to regrow your microbiome faster. There's evidence that's showing otherwise right now that we actually need to let nature take its course. But there are studies that show that every time you take antibiotics, you are decreasing your ability to regrow your microbiome to its native state. And when you put that in conjunction with the generations and generations of people who have been taking antibiotics and not ever regrowing the proper microbiome back, and then they're having babies and they're passing on a deficient microbiome to their babies, and that just keeps happening generation after generation, you end up with people who are immune-wise, they're not as strong, and there's so many factors that are impairing their overall health. It's going to impair their moods. It's going to impair their ability to think straight. <laughs> I mean, it's going to impair their ability to, to even just be able to fend off normal viruses. And so I do think this is partially why we're seeing more viral issues today. And I think that colds are happening more frequently. They're embedding longer. People are getting sicker and sicker. And I really do believe this is in part because of the massive amount of antibiotics that are prescribed. And they're still prescribed so much here. It is outrageous. Do you think that people are starting to wake up to the fact that antibiotics are bad? I do. I see evidence of that all the time. I see people making better decisions. I see them trying to focus on getting ferments into their diets. I see them trying to focus on eating better and figuring out natural ways to battle colds. I also talk to doctors on a regular basis who are trying to educate their patients on how to not have to take antibiotics. You know, I, I work with some doctors who refuse to prescribe antibiotics for viruses, which I think is a, an important stance. Like, it's much harder for the pediatricians in our country because pediatricians have to deal with a lot of flack from the parents. The parents are like, give me something now. Like, I want something for my child. There's a lot of misinformation still, but I think we're getting better. I think that we're going to have to come up with some real solutions for what people need to do to get through a viral infection, including just like staying at home and resting and relaxing and maybe the idea that you shouldn't just take an antibiotic and go back to work the next day. I think that's the biggest thing. It's like we're, we're so stuck into this, like, go back to work, be productive, do your thing. You know, there's no time for rest and recovery from these things. You've heard a lot of client stories throughout this series, and you might be wondering if we could perhaps help you. Supporting people to shift is what we do best. 
Health is a journey and we can help you to navigate this with one-on-one support with our clinical naturopaths, hypnotherapists and counsellors. If working with us one-on-one interests you, go to theshiftclinic.com and click on Shift With Us. The Shift! So what is the story of antibiotics? Penicillin, the first antibiotic, was created in 1928, less than 100 years ago. Let's hear from Rodney Dieterd about what has happened in this time. Penicillin was originally discovered by Alexander Fleming, and actually that was serendipity <laughs> in his, his discovery. It was wonderful. He'd had some other breakthroughs. He'd already made some major discoveries, as had his supervisor. Uh, and He was at St. Mary's Hospital in London, and he grew up in a Scottish rural area. And at that time in his career, he had a, had a summer home. And so it's very interesting. Uh, he was going on a month-long vacation, but uh, his son, young son, and his wife had already gone out and preceded him outside London to, to their property. And he was really anxious to get out there and play with his son and just enjoy being out of the big city. So he uh, essentially left his lab dirty. He had a bunch of petri dishes and things growing in it and uh, connected to his research. And he just kind of shoved them off to the side where, and then left town. And didn't have any help, you know, dishwasher help or lab tech help, and, and left a mess and went on and off. And then he's playing with his son and on this wonderful 30-day break from his work. And he, he goes back to the lab. And the big problem he had was he had a visitor, a distinguished visitor, came to see his lab. And it's like, oh, first day back. Oh, no. And I left things in a mess. So he took the visitor in nevertheless. And he's walking him around. And he goes over to the pile of dirty Petri dishes he left, and he says, well, look at this. I just, you know, I left in a hurry, left a mess. Look at this mess. Picked up the plate and is waving it around, and that's when he noticed what we would call a plaque, and that's where a fungal contamination, because there were people in that building on different floors that worked on molds, fungi, and one of them had contaminated his plate with bacteria on it, and it had killed them so that there was this clear area on the plate for the mold had grown up, and it produced penicillin what later became known as penicillin, and the an antibiotic, so it killed the bacteria. And he picked it up, and he's w- waving it around, and he realizes that shouldn't be there. And he said, that's curious. So my question is, would he have noticed that if it had been just another day of continuous days in the lab, doing the same old, same old, or you come back from 30 days of playing in the countryside, which we know is where he grew up and enlivened him, playing with his son, diverted, and then you come back and take a fresh look at something. So, again, wonderful, wonderful. And again, the kind of thing that I've taught to people when they're roadblocked is, you know, you find something that gives you a reset of your mind, a reset of your observations, so you can see what you couldn't see before as an observer. So, Fleming discovered this, and it later, it, it, I think it's described in Martin Blazer's wonderful book, Missing Microbes, where there was a famous fruit, maybe it was a cantaloupe, I think, or watermelon, uh, gr- with penicillin growing. And so it, it, Fleming discovered it, but it really took other uh, contributions to industrialize it, to produce it in mass. But it became extremely important in, uh, for example, battlefield injuries and being able to save lives. So uh, penicillin and then subsequent generations of antibiotics are life-saving. They were the miracle drug of the 20th century. But they also were part of, uh, at the time, what we thought was us versus microbes, that we were better off if we could be completely purged of microbes because that was real preventative medicine, was keeping away from bacteria because they could kill you. Well, some could kill you and others you need, and others you need to keep the bad ones from killing you. So... We had this mindset in the 20th century that microbes are evil, bacteria are deadly, and we got to sanitize. We got to pasteurize, we got to sanitize. So we created almost sterile environments, hand sanitizers, told our kids to clean the dirt off of them (laughs) immediately. And at the same time, we were handling our food differently. We had the luxury of frozen foods, we had processed foods. And we were moving into urban areas, and that continues today, the megacities. And so I, I have whole talks and opinions on <laughs> what, what a green environment is and what an actual healthy urban environment might look like, and they're not the same. So more of us moved into urban areas, lost the connection to the land, 
lost the connection to actually being around animals, pregnant women, newborns, on animal farms. And yet we knew, I mean, logically, you were protected against allergic disease if you were pregnant or had a young child on an animal farm that didn't use pesticides versus living in an urban city in Germany, for example. Some of the, called them the German barnyard studies. And what was called hygiene hypothesis was really examples of why you need microbial exposure and microbes in your life safely, but you need them there. So that mindset of going away from microbes are evil, we must kill them all, we must stay away from them, to the baby's got to self-complete. The baby needs a full set of microbes installed in the body or the immune system will grow up to self-destruct, which is essentially the outcome. If the immune system is not adequately trained, it will react against things in the environment it shouldn't, pollen, animal dander, peanuts, fragrances, or it will not recognize a real pathogen from innocuous microbes. So you're actually at greater risk of inflammatory mediated self-destruction and it actually having gaps in your immune repertoire for infectious diseases. You see both. So contrary to what I was taught in immunology, when I was growing up and what I first taught here at Cornell in the 70s, was we always thought the newborn has a full set of immune cells. It's good to go. Everything you need is there in the newborn baby to fight disease. The immune system of the baby as born has come out of a protected environment that did not permit portions of the immune system to mature. There is uneven maturation of the immune system during pregnancy, and that has to get corrected, and it gets corrected in concert with the microbiome. It involves changing inflammatory responses, and it involves bringing up to balance antiviral responses and things like that. that if you don't do that, again, there are very predictable sets of diseases that will result. And uh, so the idea that the baby is good to go is like only if you want a world full of diseases and a lifetime full of diseases. The baby's got to co-mature with the microbiome in place. But we now know how to do that. There's still a lot of research questions, a lot of things we don't know about the microbiome, but we do know enough to be able to do useful things. And we shouldn't wait till we know everything about it to be able to do the things that we know are useful. Season two of The Shift is currently in production and it is going to be huge. In season two, we turn our attention to moods and emotions. Mental health issues are massive and there is going to be so much that we cover. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out. The Shift! As you've heard a few times throughout the series, the first seeding of your microbiome comes from your mother at birth. Your mother's microbiome actually changes throughout pregnancy and leading up to birth to get ready to pass that first dose of microbes over. Gynecologist Dr. Felice Gersh explains. If we talk about the gut microbiome, it's a fascinating story. And there's been very little. We need to do studies on the transformation of the vaginal microbiome. We do know at the end, for example, the last month of pregnancy, there's a tremendous increase in growth of various strains of lactobacillus. But what happens on a month-to-month -month or even trimester basis, we don't have a lot of data on that yet. But we know that the gut microbiome changes immediately with pregnancy. And this is really fascinating. So if you think about women who are pregnant, what's one thing you can say? They gain weight. That is nature's need. It needs to put weight on women who are pregnant. They need to store fat so that when they have their babies, they have their reservoir of energy to create breast milk and then carry through, like if it's a cold winter with little food. So if you think back in time, all those animals were born in the spring. Human babies were also born in the spring. Everything's different now. People are born any time of month. Of course, they always could be, but there was a definite preponderance for babies being born in the spring. And that's nature's way men's testosterone is seasonal. Men have more testosterone when they would conceive a baby with their partner to create a delivery in the spring. And their testosterone is different when it would be a winter delivery. Because if a baby is born in, in the dead of winter, there would be a lower survival. 
because of the food source. So as soon as women become pregnant, their gut microbiome changes. It becomes inflammatory. And you think, what? Why would their gut microbiome become dysbiotic, you know, like abnormal and inflammatory? And then women who are pregnant get leaky gut. And you think, why is that? Because inflammation creates insulin resistance. Now, we don't want this when you're not pregnant. You don't want to be insulin resistant, right? And we know that's prevalent. You know, diabetes in the U.S. is ridiculously common. And of course, pre-diabetes, they say, is like 50% of people now. It's, it's that crazy. But in pregnancy, most obstetricians know this, and a lot of women know this, you're more likely to get what they call gestational diabetes. Gestational meaning, of course, during pregnancy. Now, why would women get more diabetes when they're pregnant than when they're not pregnant? Because of the gut microbiome. This is like one of the most fascinating things because we've known for ever, it seems like, from the very beginning when I was in training, that women are more prone to diabetes in pregnancy. And then it would clear up after they had their babies. And then now we know those women are more prone to having metabolic disorders like diabetes throughout their life, and then particularly after menopause. But what is it about pregnancy and why would nature do that? Because when you have a dysbiotic, abnormal growth of bacteria in the gut and you get leaky gut and you have inflammation, you get insulin resistance. When you have insulin resistance, you have elevated insulin. When you have elevated insulin, you get fat deposition and storage. That's the problem for diabetics. They can't lose weight. If you have high insulin, you cannot lose weight because insulin by its very intrinsic nature causes fat to be stored and fat to be made. Well, in nature, they want you to gain weight when you're pregnant. That's why women can gain weight when they're pregnant even if they don't eat anything more. And that's why we now understand that getting fat doesn't necessarily have as much to do with eating as what we used to think. Of course, it does have to do with what you eat, but if you are eating toxins, you can get a dysbiotic gut creating insulin resistance and high insulin and weight gain, even when you're trying to eat healthy food. We call those things now like diabesogens. So it's really fascinating how nature changes the immune system. The immune system of a pregnant woman is so unique and different from any other state in a woman's life. And the gut automatically changes to encourage leaky gut when you're pregnant, inflammation, and high levels of insulin promoting fat. What do you think about cesarean sections then and their impact on the baby's health? And also, what do you think people can do about it? Well, the incidence of C-sections is just enormous. It, we've never had levels like we have now. What is it in the US at the moment? Well, it varies from hospital to hospital. Some hospitals have as high as 50%. You know, a really good level is considered to be in the low 20-something percent range. So there's a whole slew of reasons why the C-section rate has really increased. And of course, it's not great for the mom, you know, because she's having a significant surgery. But for the baby, it's really putting one strike against them. You know, right from the minute they're born, they have a strike against them because they've lost the vaginal lactobacillus. When I first started doing obstetrics, they would wash out the vagina, they'd wash everything off. So I don't know how much good even having a vaginal delivery did for anybody. And then we take the baby and immediately wash the baby in some kind of antiseptic. I mean, we did such crazy stuff. I, I'm like embarrassed to even think about it, that this is what people were doing to a natural process. They were wiping everything down, cleaning every because we want to make it sterile. I mean, it was because bacteria are evil, you know, that whole philosophy. But left to a natural state, having a vaginal delivery is so important for getting the microbiomes of the, the body. Remember, it's all the microbiomes. Of course, we focused a lot on the gut, but what about the skin microbiome, the vaginal microbiome? All the microbiomes of the body get a good start when they go through a healthy female vagina. Of course, what about the unhealthy female vag vagina? Well, that's what we have nowadays. So even a vaginal delivery doesn't necessarily mean you got the best start. It's better than a C-section. But what about the woman who's growing weird stuff, you know, in her vagina? It's still problematic. As you've been discovering, there's a lot that we've done in our modern world to damage our microbiome. 
So how do our microbiomes compare with that of a traditional hunter-gatherer that have lived without the advances in technology and the changes in their diets? Let's go back to Cale Brock's story and see what happened when he took poo samples to assess the microbiome of himself and the sun people. What's interesting is that each one of us carries a very unique set of bugs within our gastrointestinal tract. So we wanted to go and see what was coexisting with the sun people in Africa and how different it was to my own and whether mine changed whilst I was there. So we had all these little poo sampling kits with me from Smart DNA, Dr. Margie Smith down in Melbourne. And she was saying, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. So I sort of had a little science experiment with me and I very <laughs> nervously asked the sun people, hey, do you mind if we, um, you know, collect your poo? <laughs> and of course you got the reaction that that you would expect. I mean, caught it all on camera. And they were kind of weirded out about it, but they acquiesced. And the next day in the morning, they invited me out after they'd done their business and I would come and, and take a small sample of their poop and put it in my little container and, and pack it up and label it and take it home to Australia. And we did that. And we also looked at my poo before and after as well. And we saw that the sun had a very significantly different microbiome to begin with. Uh, it was very diverse and very anti-inflammatory in nature. And mine actually showed up as quite inflammatory before I left. And then after, it actually had improved on a number of levels. So it was quite a significant mini experiment. Again, in order to replicate this and do it on any sort of quantifiable and reliable scale, you'd need a lot of people to do that. But it was a good indication as to how quick the microbiome can change. We're talking within, you know, 48 hours in some cases. Mine was 72 hours or whatever it was. So that was quite empowering because we come away with a message that when you change the diet, when you change the environment, you can quickly encourage changes within your microbiome. And then that subsequently has a change on your metabolic system, your immune system and your neurological system. So all these conditions that we're currently dealing with these days, potentially you take away from my story the idea that we can actually overcome them and use our knowledge of the microbiome, limited as it is right now, to actually intervene in a positive way without the use of, of medication. Because we have to remember that the body is not suffering from a shortage of, of pharmaceuticals. And the microbiome, I think, is the same story. It's a very complex system and we only know a tiny percentage of what there is to know. But one of the best things I think we can do is to start re-naturalizing our environment from a dietary perspective, from a movement perspective and from a, an interaction perspective in terms of how much we get out there in nature every single day. Because I mean, what you've been doing today, you've been traveling, you've been in airports, it's a pretty sterile sort of day for you. Whereas my whole point is trying not to do that too often. It's to try and live in a way that encourages the existence, the interaction with a natural microbiome. So for me, my point of contact is the ocean because the ocean contains a lot of good bacteria that coexists with us. And, you know, when I came back, I was really big into seaweed harvesting. And, you know, when I'd go surfing, I'd see some edible seaweed and I'd pick it off the rocks, have a little nibble and then go for my surf. And I'd started fishing and I started getting a rabbit from the local butcher or whatever and getting kangaroo and doing all those sorts of things. So really trying to touch base with my local ecology to develop a geographically dependent microbiome signature myself, which enables me to thrive in this particular geographical environment. So that's really what I took away from the story is that I think we're much more in the driver's seat than what we currently think. And through those very simple day-to-day -day activities, such as eating a whole foods diet, eating fresh local produce, and then getting out in nature, we can actually start to improve our health and wellbeing quite quickly. This is a really interesting story and I would recommend watching the gut movie to find out more. All right, let's sum this up, de-science this and look at what we've learned about the microbiome. You have two to three kilos of symbiotic bacteria, yeast and viruses living inside of you. A healthy microbiome has a good level of diversity and your species are in their natural balance with one another. There are lots of things that have led to the degradation of our microbiome, including the overuse of antibiotics and other drugs, diets in excess of sugar and refined foods, exposure to environmental toxins, and too much stress. 
Your microbiome is probably the number one indicator of whether you will develop a disease or not, more so than your human genes. We need to look after our microbiomes, independent of if we have digestive symptoms or not. If you're a human living in the modern world, then it's likely that your microbes could be improved. So where to from here? What is the future of gut health? In the final episode of season one of The Shift, we talk about the future of gut health and where we can go from here. And although it's the last episode of the season, don't be sad. The expert series will be released soon. Subscribe now and you'll get access to prolonged interviews with each of our experts where they deep dive into their topics of expertise. Coming up on The Shift. And who knows what that future will look like. You heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> the crapsule revolution. <laughs> and that's help mom's microbiome and prepare what the baby will get. There is absolutely no clearer indicator of your health than your happiness. I tell people, become useless to the healthcare system by being healthy. So children are the future. I eat lots of veggies, so I'm very healthy. By now, you might be beginning to wonder what the health of your gut is like. To find out more, take our free online assessment at theshiftclinic.com forward slash quiz. It only takes five minutes and you'll get a great report with some suggestions to get you started. The Shift! This series is produced by Must Amplify. Hosted by Catherine Maslin. Executive producer, Ronsley Vaz. Music and sound design by Shade Furlong. Thank you to all of our experts. For more details on them, go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash gut. Still listening? Some of the concepts we explore on this program will take 17 years to make it into your doctor's office. The change needs to come from us, so I ask that you please share this knowledge. I don't care how you do it, a text, an email, a private Facebook message or showing a friend over coffee. Let's get this information out there. The Shift! Thank you for listening. Every listen or download of this show and hence this voice directly funds the ending of sex and human trafficking. A voice for a voice. 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 Find out more at Amplify. Amplify. Impacts. Impacts. Dot com. Dot com.